Presenter is Mr. Jeff Miller. Mr. Miller was born and raised in Plainview, Texas, and has been involved in agriculture his entire life. Mr. Miller holds a Bachelor of Science in Integrated Pest Management from Texas Tech University, as well as a Master of Science in Crop Physiology from Texas Tech. Jeff worked for 10 years, over a period of 10 years, with Delta Pine Monsanto in product development, and then worked eight years with Pioneer in drought research, sales, and agronomy. In 2017, he founded Forefront Agronomy to provide leading edge individualized agronomy insight and to support growers in West Texas. Mr. Miller, thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you. Bellies aren't uh, uh, grumbling too much, but uh, what a great program we've got on, on board today, and, and uh, really fortunate to follow up with what Bob and, and Glenn were talking about. But we're going to change gears a little bit and take some of the, uh, the insights that they provided and look at how uh, going forward with a precision mindset, how we can manage our irrigation water out here in West Texas. So, first thing whenever we think about precision is uh, and how we manage our waters, what expectations do we have? First thing we've got to ask is what is precision irrigation? And we'll cover that here in just a second. Why is it important or, or is it? And, and everybody in this room probably has a different answer for your farm. Are there profits with precision irrigation? Uh, we want to look at an integrated precision, precision irrigation system, so we're utilizing different components that we put together uh, to put this thing, uh, into practice. And then how do we go about implementing that? And finally, probably the most important piece whenever we talk about precision anything is the adoption of that uh, on a wholesale scale across the area. And, uh, but we, you've got to ask yourself these questions as we start thinking about uh, putting these things into practice. So what is precision irrigation? And really I don't want to look at it uh, from a standpoint of, of irrigation alone, but more precision water management. Because even though this year's been pretty tough, we do get rainfall. And how do we take what the good Lord's given us and make and maximize that? and then supplement everything in between with, with your yeast water. So, you, know, you look up what precision means in the dictionary and it's going to throw these, these words to you. Precise, exact, and very accurate, and then as we apply it to your yeast uh, or water in general on our crops, um, how do we go about applying that? You know, how do we make every acre give us the biggest return on that investment? And what is our expected result of, of precision irrigation? Well, ultimately, it's got to be uh, making a profit, or you, you don't need to do it, you're not going to be a business. And so that's what I want to kind of visit about today is, is you know, how do you get in the mindset to do this? Um, you know, there, it is a process. And uh, so where do we go from there? And then also, I'm going to spend uh, the latter half of this presentation visiting about some of the projects that we've got ongoing uh, with TWC and, and other things out in the area that are pretty pertinent to uh, precision irrigation. So I mentioned that, uh, that precision irrigation as a concept, and it's relatively new, uh, you know, in the grand scheme of things. Now there's been a lot of things that have come out over the last 20 years that are, that are you know, touted as precision, such as variable rate planning, fertility, but really the irrigation game has just really come on board in the last, say, 10, 12 years. And so keep that in mind that there's still a lot of things that, that uh, that we're working on trying to implement, get this, get this kicked off. And uh, so the first thing we've got to understand is that it is a concept. The next is that it's a process. And uh, in most cases, including myself, is where do you begin and how do we uh, move towards that end goal? Um, a lot of guys that I've worked with have started out, you know, you've got a, a management system that you're currently using, and it probably has worked very well for you. Um, but are there some new technologies available to help you make those decisions with a little more information, make better decisions, and ultimately make, uh, make more money down the road? And the last thing is a mindset. So how do you change your mindset from what 
we have done in the past, and how do we react to the differences that happen from year to year, whether it be weather, genetics, uh, commodity markets, all these kind of things that play into our decision-making process, and how can we take a precision mindset into that to take us to that next level. The things that precision irrigation is not is variable rate irrigation. It's not moisture probes or sensors. It's not fancy software, hardware, or apps. And the reason I say that is that these are all tools to help us get to a to an end goal down the road. And uh, every situation, every field may require a different set of these uh, of these pieces of the puzzle. It may require all of them. It may require some things that, that we haven't even mentioned here, um, you know, such as imagery and, and who knows what's what's uh, down the road. So I don't want you to get focused so hard on the hardware because I think in the past with how precision things have come out in agriculture, we tend to focus so much on on the component, the hardware, and, uh, and we haven't paid enough attention to our mindset where that needs to be, what our goals or expectations need to be. So as we look at a precision ag systems approach, um, you know, we've had variable rate seeding capabilities out here for a number of years, same with, with fertility, and I just mentioned water. But which single input will have the, the greatest impact on the other two? Uh, in my opinion, I feel like it's got to start with the water. Because why would we go out there and put the same amount of water on a higher or lower population? Why would we put the same amount of water on higher or lower amounts of fertilizer? And so we've got to understand how, how we apply this water. It's such a precious resource. How do we use the uh, you know, rain-fed environments and supplement what we can uh, to make these other two inputs give you the biggest return on your investment. So that's where I wanted to go today. So getting yourself into a precision irrigation mindset, you've got to keep a couple things in mind. First thing is, is what are the water needs of the plant? And there's been a lot of research done over the years to understand you know, at this certain stage, this plant's going to use this amount of water. As it moves through the, progresses through the season, it's going to use a little more. And then as it comes down to the end of the season, it's going to start using less. And uh, pretty much it follows, it doesn't matter what crop you're looking at, uh, but we've got to understand what those water needs are of that crop. The next thing we've got to understand is what water is available to the plant in the soil, in your irrigation capacity, in rainfall amounts. We need to understand what the active root zone of the crop is. Once again, that changes throughout the growing season and different growing seasons. Last year we dealt with a very shallow rooted crop because we had so much rain early on. This year we dealt with a, a much bigger bank because we were able to tap into some of that deep moisture that we had and we've got lots of deep roots. Well, that's going to affect how we manage that irrigation. One thing that's often overlooked is oxygen needs of the crop. And as, uh, as I've visited with especially a number of growers over the last couple of years in, in drip irrigation systems with, you know, are we overwatering some of that? And, and it's not a lack of water, but it's a lack of oxygen in the root zone. So, you know, and, and not so much in this area, but there are other areas where we have an abundance of water and uh, that overwatering area can, can deplete the oxygen uh, in that root zone. So we've got to think about that as we go into a precision irrigation mindset. Plant available oxygen. And then finally, how do we offset or optimize our weather pattern? And, uh, which is a constantly changing thing. You know, I visited with Steve Moore a while ago about our, you know, our forecast that for this week everybody was saying that it was a guaranteed deal. Well, how do you go against that whenever it doesn't actually happen? And so this, this all plays into that mindset that, that we've got to have as we approach a precision irrigation. So one of the things that we're able to utilize, and uh, there's many different types of sensors on the market, the one that we uh, use is a capacitance or a frequency domain uh, uh, moisture probe. And then what we do is go out and install this in an actively growing crop. Uh, this is just an example of, of what one of the probes looks like. Uh, it's tied to a telemetry unit that uploads data, uh, and then you're able to access that through the computer. You know, iPad, phone, those kind of things. Uh, most of these are set up where there's a sensor every so many inches. In many cases, it's about four inches in between those. And what it does is sends an electric impulse out into the soil uh, at various uh, distances away from that. 
and then measures it as it comes back into the probe to give you an idea how much moisture you've got available to that plant. Um, basically, this is what I'm talking about. As, as that electrical pulse goes out, it hits these uh, hydrogen ions, and, and that will change the amplitude of that wave as it comes back, and then that's going to give you a reading uh, for your moisture probe. You know, there's some advantages to this. It is quicker response time than, than some other probes that have been around a while. Uh, we can measure salts, so we can even manage some, uh, some of our fertility needs or monitor salty water, salty uh, soil situations, uh, and make some adjustments there. You know, there are some disadvantages to, to this type. Uh, one of them is that we still need to calibrate. And, uh, our particular drill drop probe comes with a standard soil calibration that's, that's um, common to this area, but you know, if we got into some really strange heavy clays or some really uh, really light sands, you know, I'd need to send those things off to, uh, to recalibrate. But the nice thing about these is that it gives you another set of eyes, not only in the field, but what's happening below the ground, what's happening where those roots are at, because that's where our water capture is going to be. And, uh, and the other thing is, you've got access to it 24 hours a day. You know, I've, I've walked a lot of fields over the years and stuck a lot of probes in the ground and still do that to this day. Because I believe that even with technology, you can't get rid of the boots on the ground. But um, but it's nice to have that access. You know, 3,000 data points over the course of a week, and, uh, and a lot of things can change. Whereas if I was going out just walking the field, I'd be sticking up, you know, one or two data points a week. Uh, so this is what it's measuring. You know, that that uh, that reading that comes back into the probe. If it was reading air, it would be a one. Soil is going to give you a five, and as you can see, those hydrogen ions really uh, get back a pretty strong reading for water of uh, the heat. And uh, so, just to kind of give you kind of a snapshot of how these probes work, there's one of them uh, in the soil. So, utilizing technology, <laughs> hopefully, we can help you decide when you should irrigate and how much we should irrigate. I know there's been some questions today about when we start how you manage it through the growing season, and most importantly right now is when you, when you pull the water off. And how have you made those decisions in the past? Well, many of you have been in, in the business for a long time, and, and there's an art to this. And, uh, and we don't want to take that away, because once again, those boots on the ground make, uh, make this technology uh, greater, because we can, we can play off of each other. But, but that's the things that I want you to ask yourself is, is how have you made those decisions in the past and can we make those decisions better? Especially with changing weather patterns that we've got, reduced well capacity that we have, you know, we can't do things like we did 10 years ago. So, can precision technology help us make that? I know I've had some successes and some, and some failures uh, going both ways and it's always a learning process. But I feel like with, with a little more information out there from that field, we would be able to make some more better informed decisions. So taking uh, just the, you know, you can throw in whatever crop you've got. I just had a nice picture here of the corn crop. You know, we talked about water needs um, as that crop moves along. We talked about active rooting zones. And uh, so things are going to change as we move across the, uh, uh, across the building season. You know, wet, wet rainy season early on can affect that ruby depth of any crop. And if we have a shallow ruby crop, we're going to have to change that uh, irrigation recommendation. If we have a deep ruby crop, maybe we can get by with, with uh, heavier amounts of irrigation, but at a long fly less water. There's opportunities generally on the back side of the season uh, as we start shutting water down or, or at least managing to, to uh, more maturity that maybe in the past we, we probably put on more water than we need. The number one way to make money in this business is to maximize our, our ROI. And I like to call that return on input. So for every inch of water that we put on, I want to make sure that we're getting a positive return back. And so that's why we want to we want to bring technology into the farm to be able to make those decisions with a little more confidence. So looking at what these uh, what these soil moisture sensors will bring to the uh, you know, bring to you is the data. And uh, just some simple stuff here looking at, you know, as we see a spike, that's typically an irrigation event or a rainfall event. And uh, if we want to be able to see those going through the season, 
Uh, whenever it starts stepping down, as we see it flatten out, that's little to no change in moisture content, and typically that happens during the evening. Um, these steep drops that we see is water use during the day. Uh, Substantial, you know, moisture content change. So then, you know, we want to watch this. We want to see how far those things are pulling down every day. We want to see how it's recovering. And uh, those are going to affect our uh, irrigation recommendations based on amount and timing. Um, we kind of keep, what I like to say is, is set some road ditches. So we've got a refill chart, a, reach, a recharge line here that's indicated in the red. And uh, I don't want you to get confused and think that that's when permanent wilting point is. Uh, that is an adjustable piece and depending on what crop we're, we're utilizing as well as what crop stage we're in, we may move that that line around, but we want to we want to draw that down where we can capture uh, rainfall or irrigation events. Uh, but we also want it um, not to be far enough that whenever those events do happen, that we that we can fill it back up towards the uh, the full profile line. And so that's one nice thing about utilizing some of the hardware and software that have been developed is that we can adjust these. We can make uh, changes. Uh, depending on uh, all kinds of individualized systems. But just to kind of give you a snapshot of, of what uh, what kind of data comes out. So I've got a, uh, an example here of just how we might utilize this technology. And so these are probes in uh, the same field but two different application methods. And uh, if you look at this one, this top one, we don't see much activity uh, here on the, on the lower system. Most of our irrigation soak in down to that eight inch level and, uh, and then we refill and uh, run across. As we add more irrigation to the, uh, to the crop, um, and in many cases this isn't a whole lot, uh, you know, a couple of tenths difference in a lot of cases. This is on the same frequency, but uh, we, we see a lot more activity down lower in the profile. And what happens there is we typically get boots chasing that water. So we have a bigger bank to pull from, especially when we get into July and August to be able to carry us uh, through some, some times of the season whenever we don't either have enough irrigation capacity or, or we're light on rainfall. The other thing we can do is, is evaluate our irrigation efficiency. And uh, so looking here at, at an irrigation amount, you know, we, we take where we drew down, subtract it from where we refilled it to, and uh, go across several irrigation events, average that out. Uh, this was a 6,500 of an inch application, and whenever you put the map to it, that's a 77% uh, irrigation efficiency. So, uh, whenever I was in school, that would have been a C plus, which would have got us by, but we could probably have some, some more improvements. And one thing that I've noticed uh, over the last two years, last year, we caught some big rainfall events. But how much of that rain actually got into the soil? We may have gotten two or three inches of rain, but we may have only soaked in seven tenths. So what was the uh, efficiency of that rainfall? And, and understanding that helps us to make decisions later on without an exact crop. This year with some irrigation capacity, guys tell me, well, I put on an inch. Well, I'm only seeing a half or six tenths that actually got into the soil. So are there ways that we can improve that for irrigation, or are there ways that we can improve that through cultural practices? These are all conversations that we've got to have, and it goes back to that precision mindset. So looking here at a uh, different application amount, you can see the numbers here. Um, but, you know, an 8,500 of an inch application, we were getting more water into that soil. And it uh, showed an 85% irrigation efficiency rate. So, you know, we've improved. Is there room for improvement from there? Yes. But still, understanding what we have, uh, being able to measure it so that we can manage that going forward. You know, I mentioned that we can measure salts with these uh, with these um, moisture sensors. And one thing I wanted to point out here is, you know, if you've got a healthy soil moisture content, you've probably got a healthy fertility content because as we dig deeper in the soil, we have additional minerals available to that plant, and uh, we want to be able to access everything that we can that we've got that we've got the ability to. And uh, this is just showing a nice stepping pattern as we, you know, as we, as those roots, you know, progress through the season. We're sitting here in the top, um, you know, top portion of the profile. We get further into the season, those plants are still putting the roots down deeper. Uh, we get over here into August, and we tapped into that bottom, uh, those bottom layers. 
and really, you know, we've got some rainfall events here to, uh, to bring the soil moisture content back up that affected how we manage our irrigation. But, you know, there's just ways, uh, lots of ways to be able to do this with the information that's available to you instead of just shooting from the dip. So, watch this little uh, photo here. It runs pretty quick. But uh, you know, the things that I want you to, to keep in mind, once again, is that we've got to match our water needs to the, to the crop stage. And we've all, also got to pay attention to what that rooting zone is. As you notice, early in the season, there wasn't much uh, root activity, and our optimum range over here was, was shifted down. As we got a bigger root system, that optimum range grew. And so that's part of what we're looking at as we're managing this irrigation, managing rainfall, and understanding the crop needs. Um, we're able to make those adjustments throughout the growing season and take advantage of a bigger bank to pull moisture from and to help us schedule those irrigation down better. So thinking about our irrigation mindset, it is an integrated systems approach. You know, we got to think about the weather, we got to think about the crop needs, we got to think about what's going on below the surface of the soil, how that's uh, how that water is getting in there, and uh, you know, so it all it was boiling down to from an irrigation standpoint is applying water at the right time in the right amount on every part of the field, and if we can do that. We can optimize that plant to increase our profitability, maximize our irrigation efficiency, so we're, we're getting a big spank for a buck out of that pumping cost, and ultimately conserve natural resources because we've got a, de a declining lot. So as we kind of shift gears a little bit and think, you know, in, a, in other realms of uh, precision, is I want you to think about your soil. And there's two types of variability that happen uh, in farm. First one is non-changing. This is our soil type and topography. There's nothing you can do about it. Or it costs a lot of money or take a lot of time to, to improve or, or decline. It. So how do you make decisions on what you have out there on your farm? The other thing, uh, these are foundational to what we've got to, what we're working with. Now, we're also dealing with other variables. Weather, genetics, you know, different yield results from year to year, prices. And these things are all measurable. And the nice thing about that is that if we can measure these things based on what we're given by the good Lord above, we can probably make some adjustments. We can learn how to manage that a little bit better and even more so manage it to a micro level where you know, we're, we're looking at several acres instead of a whole 120 acre pit. So the opportunity that unchangeable soil provides, and this is a Basically what I like to call this is a CAT scan of what's going on below the soil surface. Around here you look at the you look at a lot of these fields and they look perfectly flat. You know, there's not a lot of color change. But whenever you dig in and you, you um, get one of these maps uh, done, you'll notice that there's a lot of variability within a field and also across fields. And so how can we take advantage of knowing that information, especially as we relate it to water? And then maybe once we implement a water plan, look at our seeding rates, and then look at our fertility rates. And as you can see, this thing kind of starts snowballing. You know, looking at this unchangeable data, here is uh, an example in a two and a half acre grid that, uh, you know, two different soils, but we would have never captured that on that uh, in a two and a half acre grid if we hadn't just gone out there and looked at it. Going out there and, and dragging one of these um, devices, these sleds across, we're able to get a, a much better picture of what's going on at the surface, but also at three foot below, which is where our roots reside, and how do we how do we go about maybe uh, different uh, prescriptions, different management situations, zones, both horizontally and vertically. Well, I want to visit with you quickly about variable rate irrigation. And so we're starting to play around with some of this. Uh, and some of the TWC projects. And really, we're utilizing uh, zone control where we either speed up or slow down a bit uh, going through the field. And based on those different soil values that, uh, that the EM sled gave us, it's gonna give us an indication, okay, how much water do we need to apply and, and how frequently do we need to apply this on this part of the field versus another part of the field. The other thing we gotta think about is how, you know, how that water's moving through the, the soil. Uh, you know, we may have 
topography issues up here that we're dealing with, but we may also be dealing with some other layers as we start digging deeper. And so how do we adjust our irrigation recommendations based on what's happening below the soil surface, where those roots are residing, and it may, you know, we may be able to understand that a little better. You know, seeing this under, you know, you get a caliche layer here about 24 to 30 inches in some of this ground. Well, what are those roots doing? Well, you know, we have a lot of guesses until we can go out there and so just looking here, here's some foreign information, uh, looking at unchangeable data over here is looking at a three foot scan of that field and here's some examples of what that looks like. Um, but looking as, as that soil type got heavier, our yields significantly increased. And so, you know, how do we need to apply water on that? Well, you know, that's where I step in, I help, you know, analyze the data, create some zones and, uh, and look at what our irrigation capacities are. This, uh, this particular field was up in Nebraska where they had their high spots making the, uh, the most yield on a wet year. These low spots were, were dragging them down. So how would we um, apply our irrigation differently to be able to offset those things? Uh, working, had the pleasure of working with Wood Art for the last two years down in Rawls and uh, on a project where we're looking at variable rate and cotton. And so what we did this year is we split this pivot in half and uh, we're just applying a flat rate on the north side. I uh, have a moisture sensor up here to, to be able to tell us when the timing needs to be. And uh, basically we've put out an inch every time we've gone around. Uh, on the south side of this pivot, we've got um, you know, a little more variability as you can see. And uh, this was one of the most recent prescriptions. We've uh, written several of these throughout the growing season uh, for different crop stages. But as we're looking here, you know, we're speeding this pivot up a little bit. Um, and it's showing about eight, I think it's 82 hundredths of an inch in the red. We get all the way over here to the blue, we're putting out an inch eight. So really we're not, we're not talking about a, a big change in irrigation capacity. But that's what the soil type is telling us that we needed to put out here in that, that stage of the growing season. As we get around to some of these, um, you know, these other green spots, we want to be sitting right there around an inch. Last year, we saw a positive response of about, uh, I think it was 80 pounds. Uh, maybe, I think it was 180 pounds of lip. And we also saw an increased um, uh, loan rate because what, what we're ending up seeing is that these, um, where we put this water down differently, we're seeing deeper rooting depths, healthier plant going into August and September and uh, really finish those poles out. So we'll have some information coming out this fall uh, on this crop. It, it has had a struggle. Um, he's had some weather events that we've had to deal with, some multiple planting dates, and we'll kind of see how that goes, but, but still, I think you can get the gist. So looking at the, um, the soil moisture probe here, just looking at the flat rate versus the VRI, um, you know, with how we apply that, that irrigation on the VRI, you know, it seems like we're getting a little more water penetration into the soil. Uh, we didn't really start getting big uh, amounts of water pushed into uh, this, this flat rate until later on in the season whenever we caught a rain coupled with the irrigation. As we look at these uh, at the individual sensors, once again, there's not a whole lot of activity deep on this flat rate. Um, and until we get later on in the season, we can see that those roots are finally tapping into some of the you know, 18 inch range. On the variable rate, we started to get the moisture moving into the soil a little, um, a little better earlier. And then as we move through the season, we push that and we're, and we, we're tracking root growth all the way down you know, to 36 inches at, at that level. So some interesting stuff. We'll try to correlate this back to yield um, once, we, once we get that harvest. Another thing that we're doing down on Lloyd's farm is looking at nozzle spacing differences on, on pivots. So working with uh, Ferris Hightower at, at Lindsay, um, he put uh, some 40 inch drop spacings on one pivot and then we're looking over here at, at just a typical situation out here with 80 inch spacings. And, uh, and we want to you know, follow this along through the season. We install the moisture probe in both of these fields. And, uh, and tracking that, and you know, right now at this stage, I'd say you know the crop looks fairly good for everything that it's been through, and uh, so we'll, we'll be able to we'll have some harvest data at the end of the season. Um, it's interesting looking at moisture movement through the profile on the 40 inch spacing. Uh, we didn't get a lot of deep percolation of, of water down into the profile. 
But as you can tell, that crop looks pretty good. Um, you know, the flat rate, we were able to, uh, to move it down a little bit deeper. And, you know, one of the observations that, that we've made out of this is, number one, uh, we weren't getting our pivot stuck in this 40 inch spacing versus the 80 inch spacing. Because we're putting out a, uh, you know, we're spreading that volume of water across more, and, and uh, I guess we were able to keep our pivot tracks a little drier in, in that sense. The other thing, we're not pushing that water for, far out in front of the, uh, the pivot track. Um, you know, that's just creating a, an opportunity for evaporation loss. And uh, so, um, you know, looking at opportunities for this for coming years, we'll look at research is maybe we need to adjust our, our irrigation amounts here. Uh, maybe, maybe put on a heavier amount at longer uh, frequencies. Whereas over here, you know, to avoid some of the other issues that we've had, we'll probably have to stick with that 7 to an inch application just to keep it going around. So, just some opportunities looking into the future. But I think that there's some opportunity here, um, you know, looking at a, at a more even crop and, uh, and maybe helping us out with, with uh, giving that crop what it needs. Uh, switching gears a little bit to, to looking at some core information. <clears throat> I've been working with Kelly Kettner out in Milshue and we uh, doing a variable rate irrigation study on him where we're, sh we're splitting a pivot in half, half of it's corn, half of it's cotton. Uh, he's got a pretty good slope coming down here to the, uh, to the southeast and uh, some interesting you know, soil characteristics where he's got some collegiate layers to be part of that. So we put multiple probes out in this field and, uh, and really based our irrigation recommendations, we probably changed this thing four or five times through the growing season um, based on what the crop needs were uh, for both sides because we were, we were looking at the cotton as well and uh, really letting that probe tell us when we needed to irrigate and how much we needed to put down. And uh, this is a light water pivot, I think three, start, start of the year, 360 gallons, and then three miles to 300 mid-season. We planted this corn pretty light at 23,000. We just chopped it for silage and made 25 tons. And what was amazing was looking at the uh, plant characteristics from the high side down to the low side. They were all exactly the same height. Years were all at the same level, and for the most part, um, you know, they don't have a yield monitor on that on that silage chopper, but he felt like that was one of the more consistent fields that he's, that he's chopped. So we feel like we, we did the right things with uh, managing our water. Uh, looking at his cotton crop right now, same thing. We've kept a consistent plant height all the way from the from this uh, sandy hilltop down into that uh, lakey bottom. And, uh, and how we've managed that, we haven't had to get overly aggressive with our picks. So uh, some interesting opportunities looking at variable rate irrigation and, uh, and how we can implement that on our farm. You know, looking at our cotton, you know, early in the season, we were just putting on a half inch every pass. And so whenever we come out of that corn um, at an inch or an inch and a half, we would just speed back across this cotton with a half inch. And uh, just kind of giving it a little bit just to keep it going. Um, he didn't really want to reverse that back around and create problems with the pivots getting stuck, so, so we wrote a prescription for that. Um, as we got later in the season, we switched that to an inch, and, and then of course on the cotton or on the corn, we did something uh, similar uh, tracking it through. But as you can see, you know, these half inch applications, we didn't get it, get it so thin very deep, but we did have some good deep moisture to start with. As we got about a month into the growing season, we start seeing those roots. Uh, really starting to take. As we get into you know, July and August, we had roots all the way down to 36 inches, and that cotton looks as fresh today as it did uh, you know, shortly after after planting. So I uh, feel like we you know, we've managed that pretty well, even as we increase the amount and uh, we just shut that pivot off with this last week. Looking at corn, same thing. We started out with an inch application as we went across and shifted to an inch and a half. As, uh, as we look at the, where that water soaked into. Um, this is the shallow soil that we were looking at. And once again, we didn't get it as deep as maybe we had liked. But we were able to, to see some moisture pulling from those deeper depths as we got uh, into that maximum water use on the corn. Uh, as we looked at in our deeper soils, we were able to get that moisture content uh, pushed into the soil a little further and take advantage of those uh, you know, those roots of deeper depths, which, which gave us what we were looking at. 
So one thing I want you to think about is, is looking at um, variable rate irrigation and, and how they apply water. And thinking about the right amount of water in the right place. So this is uh, another field further north of us, corn field, because uh, we were able to utilize a yield monitor. But looking at a, uh, a nine-tenths of an inch application rate to an inch ten over here. You know, this is pretty consistent, about 300 bushel yields. Uh, wish we could get those around here maybe one day. But, uh, but looking at what we actually you know, see here is at nine-tenths of an inch, every time we went across that, you know, that corn made 304 bushels. As we move over here to the right, we put on more water, about two-tenths more water, it was only 300 more. So the question I have is, does more water equal more yield? And the answer is not always. So we've got to understand what we're working with when it comes to our soil types, and, uh, and then we can make adjustments from there because we were able to measure it. Um, but what we were able to do in this situation was optimize that growth of every plant, um, and it gave us more yield consistently across that field in all areas. So, as we start winding this thing down, you know, I, want to, I want you to start thinking about how can I integrate some technology into how I manage my irrigation water. It's all about, we've got to combine one thing with another. And part of that is your knowledge, your experience, but then let's take some information. Let's take uh, the data that, that we're able to generate, and then ultimately it, it boils down to, we've got to bring other people or groups. So that's what I love about this, um, this TAWC group is that we're able to share information in events like this. Um, hopefully, you know, bring someone like myself in to help manage some of that and, and we can bounce ideas around. And, uh, and that's how we're going to get better in, uh, in managing, you know, declining oils, uh, declining moisture contents, and things like that in this environment. So, requirements for a precision implementation system. You're going to need some sort of moisture sensing device, whether it's a moisture probe, a gypsum block, whatever it may be. But you're going to have to have something to help you schedule that to understand what's going on with the soil. You're going to have to have good software because you all are, are plenty busy. You can't go out there and read these things every day. So let the let the software do the work for you. You need an irrigation forecast, and a part of that boils down to a crop model and what the weather is going to give us and uh, some of the software is able to, to handle that. We've got to understand what crop staging needs are. And we've got to know where our roots are at. You know, if you're, going, if you're on a pivot, certainly irrigation companies have out here that there's anything valid, ag sense build wise and pivot track are the ones that we, that we work with pretty regularly and it, it's a minimal investment to go in there and, and tell that pivot exactly what it needs to do. But the most important requirement is to know your why. Why do you even want to go there? Is it to conserve water? Is it to make money? Is it to do both? Um, is it because you're having trouble managing things, you know, from a growth standpoint? So know your why. You know, what is the root cause? And what is your, what's the objective if you go about changing that? And what are our goals whenever we get to the end? Um, it's all about an adoption planning process. And it's going to start slow. It may be just going out and uh, implementing an irrigation schedule uh, software, you know, like we use here with TWC. It may you know, then progress to utilizing a moisture sensor and then ultimately into variable rate. And then who knows uh, what technology is going to be coming down the pipeline from there. The main thing is never plan to lose. We've always got a plan to win. And really what I'm getting at there is, is it's not about you know, depleting one side of the field to, to give the other side more, it's about optimizing both sides of that field. Um, and I'll leave with this. Technology is not the solution, but the adoption of technology is the solution. And that goes with anything that you're looking at implementing on your farm going forward. Uh, it doesn't do you any good to have it in a box. You've got to put it into a situation that it's going to be successful on your farm. And, uh, and even on that particular field. So with that, I'll uh, entertain any questions here before lunch. <laughs>